Hallelujah. And praise God. You ought to practice saying that sometimes. Just Jesus, 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 Jesus. You ought to do something in your soul. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, we praise God for all that has taken place today and blessed us in dance and blessed us in worship and blessed us in song. Amen. And praise God. Amen. Let us pray. Let us pray this friends and family day and now God we're fresh we confess we need you to speak to us and through us we thank you for being in this place most of all God we thank you for your Holy Spirit who ministers to every heart arrest now our attention help us to focus completely on you no distraction Lord that we might be centered in your will and hear a word from you we thank you in advance for this word solo deal Gloria in Jesus name we pray amen amen and praise God. I'd like to share somewhat differently today. Uh, recently I've finished a biographical work, maybe even autobiographical work. And it opens with the story of T.D. Jakes explaining that his mother had just died. At the death of his mother, he was going through a private grief that was difficult to explain. He had good theology, so he knew where his mother was, but still the idea that his mother was no longer there, he didn't realize of how hard it would be to handle the grief of his mother being gone. The book rapidly moves, crushing, from him describing this grief to him knowing that the words that he's about to hear from his daughter will be the hardest words he would ever hear. She said, Daddy, Mom's there as well, I've got to tell you something. He said somehow, in an ominous way, he knew that what she was getting ready to say was literally going to be crushing. By the time the daughter shared what she had to say, the mother had fallen against the wall, passing out. She was so devastated at the words. The 13-year-old daughter of T.D. Jakes walked in and said, Daddy, I'm pregnant. Here she was, 13 years old. She hadn't driven a car yet. She hadn't had all those experiences that one would be expected to have. And T.D. Jakes begins to walk through the process in his mind of what this meant. He didn't know what it meant, but he knew some pieces. He said, I know this means that I'm going to be the center of so many good Christians talking bad about me. They're going to say all sorts of things. He even listed some scriptures in the book that they would be saying about him because how could he be Bishop T.D. Jakes if he couldn't handle his own 13-year-old daughter? As he thought about all of this, he had to wrestle with the reality that he was still grieving his mother. He goes on to say that he held his daughter, and in that moment, he was taking the pain and the pressure that she was dealing with, and he was going to hold that. He didn't know how, but he was going to hold it. Every family will go through a testing time. Your test may not be like T.D. Jake's test, but your family will go through a testing time. There is no exception to this. The educated, the sophisticated, the Republican, the Democrat, the big family, the small family, the young family, the old family, every family will go through a testing time. And I believe there's one secret to surviving the test that every family has to go through. When I say test, actually there's multiple tests that families go through. But there's one secret that I want to share with you, and I want to share not from one text, but I want to share from the life from the autobiographical sketch or the biographical sketch of a brother named Abraham. Abraham is introduced to us in Genesis chapter 11. We've met his father and his father didn't chase after God. His father wasn't monotheistic. But somehow, Abram, as he's called in Genesis chapter 11, Abram is chosen by God. Now, this is a little strange because there's no particular reason that Abram is chosen by God. 
But in, in, in fact, God chooses Abram and he calls him, here it is, friend. And this is exceptional because you don't see this throughout the scripture. God doesn't run around picking people to call them friends. In fact, if you're ever in the Middle East, it's Khalid Allah, which means the friend of God. He's so recognized, or just Khalid, the friend. He's so recognized because God chose him. Abraham, as he would be called, became special to God. God wanted to show us what he would do through us if we were willing to enter in relationship with him. So he uses as an archetype this brother named Abraham to show all of us, if you're willing to come into relationship with me, I'll treat you so good that others will have to watch and wonder at amazement. In fact, there's a scene in the Bible where God's getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But God stops and talks to himself and says, excuse me. God says yes to himself. He said, you know, we shouldn't do this thing uh, until we talk to Abraham, seeing as Abraham is going to be blessed. We're going to bless him. You're right. So let's stop and tell Abraham. At that, they give word to Abraham so Abraham can get his nephew out and they can get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's the idea that he was a friend of God. I hope that excites you because God says you can be my friend, too. Uh -huh. Yeah, you, you could be my friend, too. You, you could. Amen. And so Abraham is a friend of God. He would be so prolific that he would send Abraham out and to see the stars, Genesis 15, and he would have him look up and said, you see all those stars? Can you count those? OK, y'all not feeling. Let me see if I my wife helped me with this. She really did. She was teaching Sunday school and we were teaching together. And I remember she came in class and she gave each table with little children a cup filled with rice. It was a little cup filled with rice. And then she said, I want you guys to pour the rice out at each table. And the table that can count the rice first will get a prize. We're going to give you candy. And I remember standing on the sideline going, what is she doing? Because these little kids, there was no way in the world they could count all that rice. There was rice, there was a pile of rice, and they would count. So the kids just started raising their hand. I counted 122 pieces. Somebody else, I counted a thousand, pastor. I mean, just going from person to person, they're just making up numbers. And at the end, she said, well, I'm glad you tried, but the reason I had you work with this rice is I wanted you to see how impossible it would be to count the number of descendants that Abraham would have. God was trying to say that Abraham would be prolific because God was saying that when you're a friend of God, that I'll bless you in every area. In fact, I'll bless you in the field and I'll bless you in the city. I'll bless you in your going and I'll bless you in your coming. I'll bless you in your uprising and I'll bless you in your going down. Abraham was blessed. And so we come to Abraham who is prolific. We come to Abraham who's a friend of God, who models what we can be with God. And we meet him early on at his first test. You see, his first test is found in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, way before the movie came out, God said, get out. Yeah, he did. God said, get out. And he was talking to Abraham. He was saying, Abraham, I want to take you to a place that you haven't been to before. I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your household. I want you to leave your past. And he was living at the time in Ur. So he was living large and in charge. He was living in a mansion. He was, they had plumbing in Ur. Things were nice there. And God said, you got to go. You got to get out. But look, God didn't even tell Abraham where he was going. He just said, get up. Let's go. That was his first test. His first test was a test of relocating. Let the church say relocating. relocating. Yeah, I like the way you said it. Ooh, you sound good today. It's the idea of letting go of your comfort. It's the idea of letting go of the familiar. It's the idea of saying, God, I'm willing not to know as long as I know you know. Woo! Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, some people didn't feel that. But look, every now and then, God tells you, you don't get to know what's next. You don't get to know my next move. You don't get to know the address. You don't get to know the way. All you got to know is I know. And as long as I know, then you'll be all right. I'm trying to help somebody because somebody's trying to figure out. But God's already worked it out. You don't get to know how God's going to help that situation. You don't get to know how God's going to pay that bill. You don't get to know how you're going to be able to grant. You don't get to know how you're going to fight that battle. You don't get to know how you're going to cross that sea. You don't get to know. You just got to know that God knows. 
Okay, let me just move on. His first test was one of relocating. And all of us will experience this test of relocating. It's saying, I'm willing to be unfamiliar. I'm willing to be in a space of darkness. But can I talk to you? Because if you're ever in a space of darkness, just remember that God is light. Woo! Good God, I feel like preaching. Yeah, so even when you don't understand and you can't feel your way and you can't see your way and you can't calculate it, just trust God. Okay, I like to drive. I really do. In fact, this week I've driven 2,000 miles. I have this week. I promise you I have. Look, I like to drive, but I don't always like to follow directions. Amen. Yeah. But look, I got this GPS system, and I like the GPS system because it always keeps the same tone. It always keeps the same volume, but it just says relocating. Amen. Or recalculating. Yeah. Recalculating. Yeah. Recalculating. So whenever I go wrong, it gets me right because it's recalculating. Can I talk to you about your life? God says, I'm going to recalculate it. If you make a mistake, that's all right. I'll recalculate. I'll make that detour lead to your destiny. Let me move on. First, 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 it was one of relocating. And we have to be willing from time to time for God to do a new thing, for God to do something different, for God to do something that we didn't plot and we didn't plan and we can't explain it. I am not in control and neither are you. I know this is hard for you to receive. Somebody feels like cussing at me right now. You are not in control. You are not not the HNIC. You are not large and in charge. God is. Okay, I'm going to move on. I just need your help because I really got to get this in your theological heart. You have to understand that you are not in control. And that is okay. Come on, repeat after me. I am not. Somebody couldn't say it. They could have said, mm-mm, mm-mm, because they are, oh, I am in control. I got my 401k. I, I worked for 40 years. I've got an MBA from a VU. I mean, I've got all this. No, you are not. In, I am not in charge. I am not in charge. Uh, one more time. I am not in charge. I am not in charge. You got to get that. You don't control your heartbeat. You don't control your intellectual or your, your the, the, the synapse in your brain. One of the smartest person I know is my mama. And she doesn't know her name today because she's experiencing Alzheimer's. I'm not saying that that's going to happen to you. Don't be scared. But I am saying accept that God is in charge. And once you accept that, then you can live life in grace. Amen. Let me move on. First, first, it's relocating. That's found in Genesis chapter 12. And you ought to check it out. But not only that, it's repenting. Now, this one had to get me. In fact, as I was looking at this one, I said, Lord, don't let me cry before the church. I I didn't just want to start bawling before the church. That'd be a distraction. Amen. But look. Check it out in Genesis chapter 17. In Genesis chapter 17, let me give you a verse. Verse 18, something strange happens. In Genesis chapter 17, you remember that God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many. And because they weren't willing to wait on God, they took things in their own hands. And Abraham made a major sacrifice of laying down with a young hottie. Yeah, he he laid down with this sister who was not his wife. Now, please understand, there was no biblical mandate stopping that at that time. I know this messes with your theology, but theology is progressive. God hadn't said at that time you couldn't have a second wife. But God did say that I was going to bless Sarah and Abraham. He didn't say anything about blessing that sister over there. Amen. And so, look, he goes along with Sarah and they get a... uh, uh, I don't better, better not say it that way. Y'all might get offended. Amen. I, I won't say side check. They, they get this woman to have the baby, the servant to have the baby. And in the servant having the baby, that wasn't God's plan. Consequently, they had Ishmael. And so you see Abraham talking to God, his friend. And he says, oh, God, this is uh, found in 17, uh, but also in 12. Oh, God, would you take, would you accept Ishmael as the child? He is my son and I love him. I love him. He's my son. And God said, I will not accept him as the promised covenant child. God says, no. What do you do when God says no? Not wait, not maybe, but no. God said no. And Abraham broken. And then he goes on to say, Abraham, I want you to send Ishmael away. Sin, and at this point, he's a teenager, and he was close to his father, Abraham. They were so close, they had nicknames. My only son, my love, my dear son. They were close, and Abraham had to send him away. Can you imagine the devastation 
of sending your son away, of seeing your son go and you don't know where he's going, of seeing him in the distance, of watching him walk off and you think, did I teach him everything I needed to teach him? Did I say everything I needed to say? Did I show him who God was and, and how much I love him? And he's devastated. Then God says, this is the test. This is the test. God says, I'm going to bless him too. <laughs> God says, oh God, I feel this. you, you got to read the text. Uh, uh, God says, don't worry. Just like I'm going to bless Isaac, I'm going to bless Ishmael. Don't worry that I'm God enough to get into this situation and bless it too. And you said, but God, you said no. But God, there's no way. And he said, uh-uh, I'm God. I can bless them both. I can bless them here. I can bless them there. I can bless them anywhere. Almost like Dr. Seuss. I mean, I can do it. I can bless him in the house. I can bless him with a mouse. I can bless him. And God says, I'm going to bless Ishmael and he will be the father of 12 princes too. He will be a great nation too. Yeah, yeah. The test is trusting God when God says no. The test is trusting God when you have to repent. Because that's what Abraham did. He repented. Too often when we think of repentance, we think of some theological uh, ascent in our heart. I've changed my heart. Mm -mm. Repentance is just you changing your heart. Who told you repentance was just you changing your heart? Pastor, I repent about how I feel about tithing. Okay, show me the check, baby. All right, just keep on going. Because repentance always deals with your actions. Repentance always deals with, in fact, it really means to do an about face. So in sending Ishmael away, he was saying to God, I am now acknowledging that Ishmael was not what you told me to do. And God in response is so gracious. God says, I'm glad you acknowledge that because you've done that. I'm going to bless him, too. That's the test. How do you repent before God? Are you willing to repent before God? Can you see the errors of your ways? Can you acknowledge that you misstep? Can you acknowledge that you messed up? Can you acknowledge that you mismanaged? Can you acknowledge that you're wrong? I knew it'd be silent right here. Just me and Jesus. Amen, Jesus. Yeah, because it's hard to acknowledge when you're wrong. But that's the first step in getting right. It's the first step in saying, God, I'm not in charge. You are. And I did something you didn't tell me to do. I went away. I, I, I didn't do what you told me to do the way you told me to do. I was dishonest. I was disrespectful. I wasn't right before you, Lord. And when you do that, God says, now I can bless you. Yes, I can. Yes, I can bless you. Amen. I feel like shouting, but I won't. Look, look. And so you see him repenting there. He repents and sending Ishmael away. But God is gracious enough to say, I'm going to bless all this and all that. But then I want to give you the next one because this one's a little harder. First, we see first we see the relocating. But then we see the repenting in Abraham's life. This comes in Genesis 17. Focus at 18. But then you see something happens that I need you to get. Because after he sent Ishmael away, he builds and forges a great relationship with Isaac. Why is that so profound? Why is that so important? I'm glad you asked. Because Isaac was not his first choice. Isaac was not what he wanted. Isaac was what God wanted for him. Come here. Let me ask you a question. Can you receive what God has given you? Even when what God gives you isn't what you wanted. Y'all missing this. I had a friend in college. I do. I did. I had a friend in college and her daddy bought her a car off a car lot. But the problem was she was on the car lot with her dad. And she saw this Lexus she really wanted. It was a nice Lexus. It was a shiny Lexus. It had leather interior. But instead he went and got this little Ford. And he, he bought this Ford for her. And, and before they could leave the lot she had to be honest and say, Dad, I, I was looking at that Lexus. And it wasn't even too much more money. I, I really want that Lexus. And the dad said, well, baby, I understand what you wanted. But I'm familiar with the engine and, and I'm a mechanic. I, I understand how the engine works. And I know you don't understand about a starter. I know you don't understand about all the electric. I do. And you got to understand that Lexus looked good, but it wasn't going to last. 
It, 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 it looked good on the outside, but it didn't have everything. And this Ford right here is a good automobile. Later on, she was glad because she understood that she didn't know what was best for her. Can I talk to you? Sometimes we don't know what's best for us. Sometimes we think we know because we saw this and we heard this and we thought this. But God says, you got to trust me that I know better for you than you. Okay, let me just keep on preaching. And you got to be willing to receive the blessing God has for you. Too often, too often, we don't want to receive the blessing God has for us. Instead, we resent the blessing God has for us. We start looking at the blessing going, mm hmm. I wanted this. I wanted that. I didn't want that. I wanted a six foot five brother. Don't say amen, sister. Amen. And you gave me this pudgy five foot ten brother. Amen. But he's a good brother. Amen. All I'm trying to say is you got to be careful to receive God's choice for you. Because at the end of the day, come here, God will let you choose wrong if you decide to reject what God has offered you. Okay, if I had time, I'd take you to 1 Samuel 18, because in 1 Samuel 18, Samuel is leading the people of God. And the people of God says, Samuel, we don't like you. We don't want you. We want a king like everybody else. And uh, Samuel says, well, look, the king's going to take your daughters for himself. He's going to put your sons in war. You don't really want. And so finally he goes to God and says, God, I don't understand why you, your, your children, your, your folk are so, not y'all, not y'all, but in 1 Samuel, your, your folk are so rebellious. I don't understand. And he said, don't worry, Samuel, they didn't reject you. They rejected me. Come here. When you reject what God has for you, you are not just rejecting it. You are rejecting. I'll just keep on preaching. Amen. Amen. I'm almost done. You've been wonderful. I'm going to take my seat real soon. First, it's relocating. Then it's repenting. Thirdly, it's receiving. But finally, it's resolving. And you know this story because it starts in Genesis 22. In Genesis 22, God gives him not a just another test, but a final test. This is the test that every family will have to come to. Look, it's a hard test because now God says, hey, Abraham, why don't you take Isaac, your son, I want you to sacrifice him. I want you to offer him as a sacrifice. Now, if this, Abraham had gone through all these other tests, had obeyed God, done what God asked, so it just doesn't make sense at this point. Wait a minute, God, you said he, you said he was going to be the promise. Now you're going to have me sacrifice Isaac? Yep. Yep, I want you to sacrifice him. It was so daunting and so difficult for Abraham that for three days he mourned before he made the sacrifice. But after three days... He determined in his heart that he would be resolved, that he would be, he would be uh, resolute, that no matter how difficult it was, I'm going to sacrifice my son. Now, be careful. If you just rush past this text, you'll read this like you're talking about a little boy. But the word here that's used for Isaac is in Genesis 22 is a young soldier. It, it, he's the age of a young soldier. So he's probably around 17, 18 years old. And he had such a good relationship with his son that he could say to his son, son, carry the wood. Son would carry the wood. Son, we're going over there. Mount Moriah, we're going to offer a sacrifice. The son said, Dad, I, I, I see the fire. I, I got the wood. But where is the sacrifice? Son, son, now he's old. God will provide. At that, his son has so much, Isaac has so much respect for Abraham. He says, if you say God will provide, God will provide. And then we know that Isaac laid down on the altar. He laid down on the wood. He trusted his father so much that he said, even though this hurts, I'm going to trust. And his father Abraham now is resolved in his heart. I can see tears in his eyes. I know his heart is broken. I, I know he's asking why. I, I know he's asking when, what, and how. But he lifts up the knife to sacrifice his son. And then God says, stop. Stop. I just wanted, I just wanted you to see who you become. I just wanted you to know that you have gotten to the place where you trust me. You love me more than anything or anyone. Love always has priorities. You can never put love on an equal plane. You always got to rank them, baby. And he says, now, God, I love you more than anything. 
I love you more than Isaac. I love you more than Ishmael. I love you more than Ur. I love you more than everything I've had, than everything I am. I love you so much. I am resolute to sacrifice unto you. And God says, well done, Abraham. All I'm trying to say is that's what God wants us to get to. And when we get there, the blessings. Do you know why tests are given? I'm almost done. I promise I won't shout too long. Do you know why tests are given? You, you have been in school? No? No? Do you remember a test in school? Why did they give you the test? Somebody said to see what you know. Okay, that's close, that's close. But, but let me explain how tests work. Tests are often done in silence. Because a, a good teacher or professor does not want to interrupt you because they know what they've taught you. And a good test never asks anything of you that you haven't been taught. They don't ask you calculus questions if you're in Algebra 1 because they didn't teach you that. But then whenever you pass the test, a good teacher, a good professor will then promote you. Because the purpose of every test is promotion. I had your time. I take you to Genesis chapter 14. Where he says, I've got a reward for you, Abraham. He says, how can you have a reward for me, God, when all I have is Eleazar, my servant? I don't even have a child. And God says emphatically, and I was looking at it in the Hebrew, it really could be heaven's no. God shouts back at him and says, no, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. God says, whenever you pass the test, I've got a promotion for you. I've got a blessing in store for you. Now, you don't have to understand the test. You just have to pass the test. Once you pass the test, baby, God says, I'm going to bless you so good that you'll look back and says, it all makes sense now. I understand why God put me through this and put me through that. I understand why my heart had to be broken. I understand why my body had to be hurt. I understand why my mind had to be confused. I understand why I had to go through because God wanted to bless me, but he couldn't promote me until he tested me. But after he tested me, he could bless me. Okay, let me take my seat. Uh, you've been wonderful. Thank you for letting me preach a, an uncommon sermon. Look, as I take my seat, one of our members, she doesn't mind me sharing, I ask her. Uh, she, uh, 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 Minister Lovely Brown shared about her nephew who has sickle cell. He has sickle cell. If you know anything about sickle cell, sickle cell is a bad. It's almost a tragic disease that primarily affects African Americans. And it's when the body really starts attacking itself, the cells are sickle. So they, they get pain. They have to lose organs. It's a terrible disease. And look, one of the things they say to parents who have children or, or who have the sickle cell trait is don't have another child. Don't have another child because if you have another child, it's just going to be another child suffering. But look, her nephews, uh, the, the family had another child. They had a little girl, but the little girl didn't have sickle cell. And look, they found out that they found out that, look, the little girl has perfect a uh, bone marrow match. So now this little girl who only three is going to go into surgery. They're going to take her bone marrow. They're going to give that bone marrow to the brother who's five. And because of that, uh, he will be healed. Yeah. I'm done. God, God, he's doing something. You don't have to understand it. But when he takes Christ to Calvary and he crucifies his son, he knows that he's going to resurrect his son, but he's not just going to resurrect his son, but he's going to resurrect everyone who was dead in sin. Anyone who received Christ will now have new blood. They'll now have a transfusion. They'll now live without sin. Can I talk to you? Trust God in your testing times that God somehow will calculate that God somehow will recalculate that God somehow will use it for his glory and your good. And you'll look back at that thing and you'll say, God, I thank you for breaking me because while you were breaking me, you were making me. I thank you for crushing me because while you were crushing me, you were helping me. I thank you for all the people who talked about me and lied on me. I thank you because I was embarrassed then, but now I'm shining because God uses it all for his 
glory and your good. Oh, yes, he does. T.D. Jakes, I open by telling you about his daughter, Sarah. His daughter, Sarah, who was 13. His daughter, who was pregnant, 13, by somebody who shouldn't have been the father. How embarrassing. How shameful. Now his daughter is traveling the country. She's preaching and teaching. She's powerful. She's got an anointing on her life. But once she starts to talk, you've got to listen. You say there's something different about her. There's something anointed about her because she went through the crushing. Because she went through the test. And when you go through the test, there's always a promotion. You just got to be willing to go through and trust that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until completion. Let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. When God puts you through a test, that's a blessing. Because God wants to see if you'll trust him. If you'll trust him. For those of you who needed a single scripture, let me give you one. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. Abraham obeyed God. Okay, that didn't get you. Uh, what about that one that says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. The doors of the church are open. That means if you haven't trusted God with your soul, if you haven't trusted God with your soul, if you haven't said, God, I'm not the captain of my fate. I'm not the maker of myself. But I need you. I need Jesus Christ. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you right now to take the step of faith. Come on, my brother. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The step of faith. Hallelujah. Praise God for you, my brother. Praise God for you, my brother. Look, when you take a step of faith, you're saying, God, I'm entrusting my life to you. Look, now I understand. I understand. Well, I don't want to do this thing publicly. I'm a private kind of person. I don't want all my business shared. You know, people are going to say, why you walk down the aisle? And, you know, what you're, what you're going through. But look, God says, I want you to get to the place where you're not ashamed of my name. I want you to get to the place where you're more interested in lifting me up than in holding on to your reputation. God says, publicly, I want you to come. Publicly, I want you to share. Publicly, I want the world to know that you belong to me. So first for Christ. If you're here today, you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, you can come right now for salvation. 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 Salvation is like birth. It's a starting place. And it's a great place to start. But not only for salvation, what about membership? Do you have a church home? Do you have a church family? Do you have a church home? Do you have a church family? Now, I know this is a sensitive subject. I know it's a sensitive subject. There are many here today, and you say, well, I don't believe in joining the church. You know, I, I, I'm not into public religion. I'm not into joining the church. And I just got to challenge you that God has prescribed this partnership called church. This is God's plan for your life. God has called you to be part of his church. So if you're here today, come on, look at me, look at me. Don't look around. I don't want you to be distracted. Come on, come in. If you don't have a church home, you're missing out. If you don't have a church home, come here. You're missing out. It's like not having a dentist. Yeah, you need a dentist. Okay, it's like not having a beautician. Okay, uh, uh, it's like not having a mechanic. There's some things you need. You need a church. You need a, a place where there's a group of people who are praying for you, who are encouraging you, who are challenging you, who are asking you tough questions. You need a church family. If you don't have a church family, hallelujah!